day. We're so grateful to be in God's presence and it's always great to worship together and to honor God together. We proceed with the topic and we have been going through for some time in our Bible studies. Bible calls has touched on it as well. Uh, the matter before us is coming out of Babylon that is already falling. Babylon is already crumbling and we do need to hearken the voice of the Holy Spirit as he says, come out of her, my people. You don't want to be part of a structure that is collapsing when there is a place that God has set for you to run to. And let me just say, summarize, you know, the, the last Sunday's uh, message, we spoke about Babylon and what it is. We said this is a global, political and economic governmental system, which is very oppressive, especially on God's people. And we said this system is currently represented by the modern day superpower, which is America and NATO. And uh, you need to understand again that, uh, you know, prophecy is a very tricky uh, 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 terrain. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a very tricky sphere in the sense that if prophecy unfolds in your generation, sometimes you don't believe it. If, if you, for example, came to people during the time of Christ and you said to them, are you aware that the Messiah is living, is, is living amongst you? The chances are they will not know what you're talking about. And yet, they were the very generation who, who were experiencing divine visitation. So, the fulfillment of prophecy in each generation tends to be a very difficult thing to, 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 to grasp. That is why when Jeremiah says, we are the generation that will experience the capturing of Judah into Babylon. Believe me, Jeremiah was a lone prophet. No one believed him. That the Babylonians were coming to capture the nation of Judah. And up until King Nebuchadnezzar came, no one believed. Jeremiah was persecuted. He was imprisoned several times because his message was regarded as a false message. Every time people saw Jeremiah, they said, there comes this prophet of doom and gloom. Let's stone him to death. This was the life of Jeremiah because people just could not accept we are the generation that will see the captivity of Judah. So I want us to understand that every time there is a seismic prophetic event happening in a generation, very few will identify it. Very few will identify it. I don't know why you may read about these things in scripture many times, but I, maybe there is discomfort associated with fulfillment of prophecy to a point that we often think it's the next generation, it can't be us. Maybe it's our children. And right now we're on the brink of World War III. But people are still denying that this could happen in your generation. So it, it, I say to you, that's why some, year, some, some, some weeks ago I ministered on denialism. As, as one of the Achilles heel of the church. We, we have, we have a, 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 a serious weakness in the church. When we don't like it, we deny it. That is why we prefer motivational talks even when prophetic events are breaking out before our eyes. Rather, you come and motivate me. That's why when Jeremiah was ministering, people did not like what he was saying and they called Hananiah. Hananiah said everything they wanted to hear up until he was killed. So we, we, we want to encourage you, beloved, when you see something that is uncomfortable unfolding before your eyes, rather than burying your heads in the sand and pretend like it's not happening, face it. You know why you should face it? Because the grace of God is there for you to face it. There is no way that God can allow us as a generation to face these seismic events if the grace of God is not up to it. 
The reason why you are a generation that will witness these things is because the grace of God is sufficient for our generation. Praise the Lord. So please be encouraged. Soldier on. Press on in the midst of things that you don't prefer. Hallelujah. Now, we have this American superpower and NATO. And of course, China is rising up. There is no doubt about that. But as we stand, the current Babylonian system, if you probably want to check along this understanding, you need to understand that the Babylonian system has always manifested itself through superpowers. It started with the kingdom of Nimrod and the Assyrian kingdom. Then it was the Babylonian kingdom. Then it was the Greek kingdom. Then it was the Roman Empire. Now, in modern times, we have America and NATO. And that is why we are seeing what we are seeing by way of oppression, of oppression. And there is this cancel culture that we are dealing with, um, and, and, and conservative views are being canceled out in our social media platforms. And, and that is why people were so excited when Elon Musk uh, uh, decided to buy Twitter, because there is an understanding that now, at least for a change, conservative views will be allowed on social media platforms. Why? Because the culture, the Western culture, is anti-Christian and is anti-conservative values. Now, this system we said last week, it's a system that is brutal. It is an ancient spirit that is always spilling the blood of the innocent and the blood of the saints. And Revelation chapter 18, verse 24, the Bible says, In the hair was found the blood of the prophets and the saints. And no wonder abortion is so prevalent again in this culture, the Babylonian culture. The sacrifice of children. There is a, a profound statement that Mandela made some years ago. Uh, he said something that I thought maybe the Western powers would take note of. He said, if you want to know the morality of any nation, Watch how it treats its children. And I thought that was a very profound statement. Both born and unborn, I will add. Both born and unborn. If you want to know how the moral state of a nation is looking like, watch how it treats its children. And we have a situation where Millions and millions of babies are killed in our generation in the name of convenience. And we can tell if that be an indicator of morality. You can tell that we are on a downward spiral, morally speaking. And not only is this true in Mandela's words, but it's true even in the word of God. God loves children. God loves children. And that is why God wants the nation of Israel. He says, listen, the land of promise that you are going to, there is a practice there where people sacrifice their children to God called Molech. Don't even think of doing that. But lo and behold, by the time Nebuchadnezzar came to Judah, King Zedekiah was already practicing sacrifice of children. And I want us to understand that the equivalent of sacrifice of children to Moloch in our modern day times is abortion. Abortion. Pedophilia. The molestation of children. Are you aware that there are rich people who practice as a matter of of rituals. As a matter of rituals, they practice molestation of children because in their satanic, perfected thinking, they are assuming that when you sleep with a child, you gain more power. There are even islands that are dedicated to molestation of little children where rich billionaires and multi-millionaires, powerful politicians, 
and influencers of our time go to to engage in this satanic ritual. That is why Jeffrey Epstein was arrested. And that is why when he was about to name names, he was mysteriously killed in prison. And the official report was, it's a suicidal act. The visitors of his island include some of the most powerful people we have in our times. We won't name names. Why? Because there is this God of this age, Molech, that is busy controlling the Babylonian system. Kill the children. Kill the children. And they understand that if you can kill more and more children, if you can devastate more and more children, somewhere amongst them there is a prophet that should never rise up. There could be a Moses amongst them. Kill them. There could be, there could be, there could be a deliverer of this generation. There could be a preacher, there could be an evangelist. Kill them before they even gain a voice. So I want us to, to understand that the generation we are in, beloved, especially the Babylonian system, compared to the millions and millions of babies that we have killed, beloved, if you really want to reflect on that, we are long overdue for judgment. Hallelujah. That is why I said one of the reasons why we should be coming out of Babylon is because this is a castrating system. When the noblemen of Judah were taken to Babylon, they were supposed to serve in Nebuchadnezzar's palace. And for them to serve in his palace and parliament, they had to be castrated so that they could not sexually engage with Nebuchadnezzar's wives and his concubines. So they were castrated. And we spoke about this indicating infertility in the spirit, sterility in the spirit. In, in other words, you are unable to reproduce even in the spirit. And we said it's about time that we confront this spirit of castration in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. We have to confront this because you are called not to be fruitless. But you are called to be fruitful, praise the name of Jesus. You are not called to move around the same mountain for 40 years. But you are called to take possession of the land that is flowing with milk and honey. Praise the name of Jesus. Fruitfulness is the hallmark of a disciple. It is a hallmark. John chapter 15 verse 8. It is to my honor and glory that you be fruitful. Proving yourself to be my disciples. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say, fruitfulness is your portion. <laughs> by virtue of following Jesus Christ, by virtue of being a disciple of Jesus Christ, fruitfulness should be your portion. Again, it the let me just say this emphatically. It is wrong for a believer to do one and the same thing and not see the results. Amen. If you are doing one and the same thing and you are not seeing desired outcomes, it's time to shift. It's either you are wrongly positioned or you should be doing something else. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. So fruitfulness is your portion. That's why the scripture says, Blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord. He is like the mountain of Zion, which is unshakable. Hallelujah. He will bear fruit in everything that he does. Hallelujah. Such is your portion. The Bible says in Psalm 92, even in your old age, you'll be bearing fruit. Are you hearing me? While others are taking pension, you will only be starting. Praise the name of Jesus. Why? Because you are meant to be fruitful till you go to your father. Are you hearing me, beloved? The grave is the only thing, is the only thing that will stop you from fruitfulness, not old age. I want to say that. Not old age. That is why we don't retire in the kingdom. Praise the name of Jesus. We don't retire in the kingdom. We confront your arthritis in Jesus' name. We confront everything, every little pain that is telling you you should be retiring. No, you, we don't retire. We preach in the kingdom. We evangelize in the kingdom. And that is why you should refuse to be comfortable in your bed when others are preaching and ministering in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Don't just sit in your bed and sipping coffee and soup because you feel that it's too cold. It's winter. No, 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 no. You are made of a much better material than that. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. 
I speak health over you in the name of Jesus. Ill health will not be an excuse. You will fulfill. You will fulfill your kingdom assignment till the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Your old age will not stop you. That is why Caleb and Joshua say, listen, we are strong still as we were as young men. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. And, and, and they, they, were, they were like 85 years old. Yeah. But they are still saying, I feel like a 40 year old. Yeah. Praise the name of Jesus. Can you imagine an old man, a grandpa, saying there is more land to take. There is more land to take. Hallelujah. But there is more land to take. Let's go to war. And I pray for grannies like that. I pray for, grandpa, for, for grandpas like that. Praise the name of Jesus. I refuse to retire. I refuse to be confined into a space of comfort. Praise the name of Jesus. We will do the uncomfortable. So don't listen to your body, listen to your spirit. Amen. I told you last, last Sunday that uh, I did not feel like coming to church because I was feeling very, very sick. Yeah. But the moment I came, I felt the spirit of purpose saying you can do this. Praise the name of Jesus, you can do this. You can worship, you can stand up and worship. You can lift up your hands. Even if your body is painful, you can lift up your hands. In, 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 that, last Sunday, I was just praying. Pray, I prayed, just, I said to the Lord, just give me the strength to stand. If, if I can stand, maybe you need to change this mind. If I can stand, if I can stand, I can preach. Praise the name of Jesus. And, 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 thanks. and then that, that, that is what I was praying for. And God gave us even more than the strength to stand. So please be encouraged, beloved. Say again, fruitfulness, fruitfulness. is my portion. Hallelujah. And then we said Babylon is a place of identity crisis. And please know who you are in Babylon. Amen. When people don't know who they are, please know who you are. Amen. The devil is after your identity. And we said when you know your identity, you will not even compete with anyone. Amen. Praise the name of Jesus. You will be secure in your lane. Oh, yes. There will be no competition. There will be no envy of other people fulfilling their purpose and calling because you know who you are and you are safe in your skin. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So we're not in a competition against one another, but we're here to fulfill the purposes of God. Praise the Lord. So identity crisis is a problem in Babylon. That's why they tried to change the name of uh, 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 Daniel, Mishael, Azariah, Hananiah. They were given new names. Just to confuse who they were. And praise be unto God that they did not allow that to change their destiny. And we also spoke about corruption and defilement. In Babylon, there are strategic agents of the kingdom of darkness that have been placed there to ensure that you are corrupted. You are defiled. And once you are defiled, your destiny is compromised. And I want you to take this very seriously, beloved, because we live in a culture, again, even within the house of the Lord, where people assume that you can do anything and still fulfill your calling. Yeah. There are dimensions of grace that you cannot reach if you constantly walk in corruption. Sure. Yeah. Don't allow the system of Babylon to corrupt you. And there is a growing culture of moral depravity that has crept even into the church. Don't allow it, beloved. Believe in the old-fashioned gospel of holiness. Embrace holiness. Even if it's no longer fashionable to walk in holiness, but embrace holiness. We spoke at length about this, that uh, again, you don't want to be one upped by the principalities and powers of darkness because you, 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 you go around saying, I'm the powerful man or woman of God, when demons know exactly who you are. That is why they will confront you and say, Paul, we know Jesus, we know who are you. And we don't want to be fighting losing battles oh simply because we are morally depraved, sure. morally compromised. Hallelujah. Amen. And I want to again say this emphatically, beloved. You cannot dissociate your moral standing from holiness. Modern preachers are trying to dissociate moral soundness from holiness. They say holiness is just a state 
that you are endowed by God by virtue of confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. After that, you have no moral obligation. It's a lie from the pit of hell. God demands moral soundness as part of our holiness expression. Says This is very important. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 14, verses 3 to 5, they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could lend the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Hear this. These are those who did not define themselves with women. For they remained virgins. They followed the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among mankind and offered as first fruits to God and the Lamb. Listen to this. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. This is holiness. This is holiness. Sexual purity is mentioned by name. A mouth that is not filled with lies mentioned by name. Blamelessness mentioned by name. So we cannot, beloved, distort the word of God in order to fit a lifestyle of depravity. You should not customize the word of God to your lifestyle. But you must customize your lifestyle to the word. Praise the name of Jesus. Are you hearing me, beloved? And that is when you customize your life to the word, that is called transformation. But when you customize the word, to your lifestyle. <laughs> when you try to alter the word to your lifestyle, that is called false doctrine. Yeah. And I pray in Jesus' name that you understand these things because we are living in a very arrogant generation where if it's in the word, we will change it just to suit what we prefer. In Babylon, there is no freedom of worship. In Babylon, there is a fiery furnace that awaits you if you insist on worshiping. As we see, this happened with the three Hebrew men. They were put into the fiery furnace for insisting that they will not bow before the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel was thrown into the lion's den for refusing to worship the king's image. And I pray again that you be among those. May you be the Daniel of our time. May you be the Azariah, the Mishael of this time, the Hananiah of this time, who will say, I'm not going to bow before the statues of this world. I'm not going to bow before the images of this world. I will worship God and Him and Him only. Praise God. It's time to be resolute, beloved. It's time to be resolute. There are no gray areas anymore. Everything must be black or white. Hallelujah. There is no neutral zone. That is why when the nation of Israel was confronted, and this is the question that is posed by the prophet Elijah to the nation of Israel, how long will you be shifting between two gods? How long will you be shifting between idols and Jehovah? If God is God, worship him. If you are convinced that idols are real, worship them. Hallelujah. The time for lukewarmness is over. We need the worshippers to stand up and be counted. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are living in times when the true worshippers of God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And there is nothing in between. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. And I pray in Jesus' name that again you be a clear worshipper. May there be no ambiguity. May there be no hypocrisy. May you be a true worshipper. And let me just encourage you, when we talk about a true worshipper, when we talk about a worshipper without ambiguity, we're not necessarily talking about someone who's perfect, but we're talking about someone who's repentant. Amen. Hallelujah. And let me just again touch on that. The, the, listen, it is more admirable, beloved, for people to falter and repent, humbly repent, than people who are trying to distort the word of God in order to explain away their misgivings. Amen. There is no honor. We, we honor you more in your witnesses when you say, listen, I faltered here. And I submit under the authority of God's word than trying to justify your misgivings. Amen. Praise the Lord. So I want us just to understand, beloved, that this is a season when the church must walk in repentance. God is not looking for perfect people, but he's looking for repentant people. 
And repentance, by the way, is not playing games with God. Amen. When we repent, we do not play games with God. Amen. It's not saying, I'm sorry. Knowing very well that the moment you get off your knees, you will do exactly what you are apologizing for. But repentance simply means, Lord, I am sorry and I'm not prepared to repeat this again. So it's not a God, that's true repentance. In other words, it, it, you are taking a turn. You're saying, I am, I am taking a turn here. This is a moment of turning back into righteousness. Hallelujah. That's very important. Because again, it will not help you to confess your sins every time. Confessing your sin, you confess the same thing. Day in and day out, you are confessing the same thing, but there is no turning. Yeah. Hallelujah. There must be turning. Hallelujah. So, worship in Babylon is very difficult in the sense that they are trying to make you compromise. And the Bible says, do not conform any longer to the standards of this world. We are praying for non-conformists. Hallelujah. We are praying for men and women who will be non-conformist. Men and women who will be resolute. Men and women who will stubbornly hold on to their faith. Praise God. The fall of Babylon will be in threefold, beloved. And I want to talk about three phases of this fall so that you understand what is prophetically happening in our generation. The face phase that is going to be happening. And interestingly, all these three phases might, might be witnessed by our generation. We are the generation that could witness the threefold fall of Babylon. It's very interesting. In Revelation chapter 18, verses 9 to 20, the Bible speaks of the three war fall of Babylon. There are three wars that are pronounced as Babylon begins to crumble. There are three segments of crumbling that we see in Scripture in Revelation 18, verses 9 to 20. But let me just speak about how this is going to unfold as we have alluded to this in our Bible studies. First phase, there will be an attack on Babylon by the northern forces. This is found in Jeremiah chapter 50. You can read us a uh, Mamun uh, if you do have uh, 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 the mic. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 50 verses 2 to 3. And uh, there is an army that Jeremiah the prophet refers to that will come and attack Babylon. Announce and proclaim among the nations. Lift up a banner and proclaim it. Keep nothing back but say, Babylon will be captured. Bell will be put to shame. Marduk filled with terror. Her images will be put to shame. And her idols filled with terror. A nation from the north will attack her and lay waste her land. No one will live in it. Both people and animals will flee away. Hallelujah. The last part of verse 3 says, a nation from the north will attack her. And that nation from the north, during the time of Daniel, was the Medo Persians. The Medo Persians came and they destroyed Babylon. But in our generation, the second fulfillment of this passage refers to a situation where Russia and her allies will attack the modern-day Western superpower. Mainly epitomized by America, as we've said. And again, these are things that are not easy to handle. This is not your typical Sunday message because a lot of people are scared of talking about these things. But we need to be aware. I don't believe that we should be alarmed like non-believers when these things happen, when everything is in Scripture. You cannot have everything in Scripture that is meant to prepare you for what's coming, but you decide like, no, it is just too uncomfortable to contemplate. I don't want to talk about it. Tell me a good message. Give me a feel-good message. No, no, no. We need to be aware. America will be attacked. America will be invaded by the northern forces. And I want to say again, it could happen in your lifetime. What you see happening in the Ukraine is about to spill over into other European countries. And as it spills over into Europe, definitely it will cross the Atlantic and spill over into America. 
This is the word of God. The northern forces are coming. And our modern Babylon will be invaded. Now there is a scripture in Daniel chapter 7 which again gives a, a, a very good allegorical picture of what is about to happen. This is Daniel chapter 7 verses 4 to 5. Uh, chapter 7 of Daniel verses 4 to 5. The first was like a lion mm -hmm. and it had wings of an eagle. Let me interrupt as you read. A lion, very interesting Prophetic symbolism, a lion often uh, uh, is, is, is a symbol of the United Kingdom. Out of the United Kingdom, you have America. Out of the United, if you know your history, out of the United Kingdom, you have an English colony in the form of America. That is why at some point in America, in their history, they have what is called the War of Independence, when they were trying to set them free from the British. This is the war that was led by George Washington. That is why George Washington is acknowledged in America as the father of modern America. So, the lion, origins, United Kingdom. This is the symbolism in scripture. But now this lion had wings like an eagle. The eagle is the symbol of America. That is their national symbol. So now, this lion, this English nation, or in, a, a nation that has English origins, but now has wings like an eagle. America. And then the, the, the prophet says, I watched until its wings were torn off. You can continue from there, Mami. Okay. I watched until its wings were torn off mm -hmm. and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human gear and the mind of a human was given to it. Now, as this animal with wings of an eagle but a body of a lion is being torn apart as it is being destroyed, notice another animal rising to power. Listen to what follows. And there before me was a second beast mm -hmm. which looked like a bear. Yes. It was raised up on its one on one of its sides, mm -hmm. and it had three ribs in its mouth mm -hmm. between its teeth. Now the nation that is represented by a bear symbolism is Russia. That is why they say don't anger the bear. Referring to Putin. Yeah. Don't anger the bear. So Russia rises after this lion with wings of an eagle has been destroyed. And then you have this bear raising itself up with three ribs in his mouth which could signify powers of the western kingdom or the western superpower. Where, where the centers of power are could include the United Kingdom itself, America, and Europe. Three ribs in its mouth, in the mouth of the bear. And these are most likely centers of power of the modern superpower, which is again America and NATO. So I want us to again appreciate that this is being fulfilled right before our eyes. In the olden time, the bear was referring to Middle Asia. And the lion with wings was referring to Babylon. But in our modern times, this refers to America, that is the lion with wings, and Russia, that is the bear. So this is happening. Now, the chances are, in an average church setting, these issues will not be touched on. There is absolutely no way it will make sense to you when we say come out of Babylon if you don't understand these dynamics. Yeah. If you don't know that the bear is coming for the lion, you will see no agency in coming out of Babylon. And coming out of Babylon simply means you need to remove yourself from the system so that you live in accordance with divine provision, so that you live in accordance with God's way of providence. This is important because 
the lion with wings that many of us have come to depend on is about to crumble. And again, God does not want you to die with this lion. When its wings are torn, you should not say, I am not able to fly. Because your flying does not depend on its wings. But your flying depends upon waiting upon the Lord. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like an eagle. Not the America's eagle, but God's eagle. Amen. May you fly through God. Praise the name of Jesus. May you take to heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not by the power of modern superpowers. Praise the name of Jesus. It's time to depend on God. Not the system of this world. And then I want us to appreciate the second phase of the destruction of Babylon. This will be accomplished during the time of tribulation. And is found in Revelation chapter 17 verses 16 to 18. If Mam Pafele can read us verses 16 to 18 of Revelation 17. Now, this will be accomplished by the Antichrist and the Ten Kings. So, in other words, Russia is not going to totally destroy America, Russia and her allies. They will not totally destroy America. There is coming another phase when the Antichrist will now execute another attack upon America and her allies. And, and, and this we find in Revelation 17. You can read 16 to 18. The beast. And the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. Mm -hmm. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. Mm -hmm. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Mm -hmm. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing, agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. It will appear that even after the Russian invasion, there will be some vestiges of this Western superpower in America. There will be some remains of power. Maybe there is a new order that will be established. But when the Antichrist shall rise up, the false messiah, as he rises up with ten kings without a kingdom or without any form of a, a, a official position, when these ten, ten kings come, before the Antichrist is raised to power, they will ensure that America is done away with. That's a second phase of destruction of Babylon. Notice again that even during the time of tribulation, Bible calls attached on this, when God says come out, for some reason, some remain. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's very interesting that for, for many of us, the lift takes a bit too long to get up. Some of us take too long to smell the coffee. Sure. So even now when we say, come out, come out, some will remain. Some will remain to the point of even remaining during the time of tribulation after the rapture of the church. Even during the time of tribulation, God will be graciously saying, come out of her, my people. Praise the Lord. So that is when the Antichrist and the Ten Kings will be destroying America. The Bible says, they will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Yeah. And then the phase, the third phase of her destruction will be concluded by God's judgment. Mm -hmm. And this is towards the end of the seven year tribulation period when the city that rules the world is totally destroyed. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Let's read about it, Mom Pathele. Revelation chapter 18, verse 21. This is God's judgment just before the return of Christ, towards the end of the seven-year tribulation period. Then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone yeah. and threw it into the sea mm. and said, With such violence, the great city of Babylon mm -hmm. will be thrown down never to be found again. Now this is, this is heavy. Now this means complete removal of America from the map. Never to be found again. And this is the ultimate last phase of judgment. 
And by this time, hopefully, that word, come out of here, my people, shall have been received by all that are supposed to receive it. Praise the name of Jesus. And that is why God says to the angel, pick up a boulder, that's a huge rock, and throw it into the sea. As the water splashes, such will be the great violence that will be witnessed when Babylon is thrown down, never to arise again. So this is the fate of America. Unfortunately, we pray in Jesus' mighty name that the Lord may provide a Goshen for our brothers and sisters who are born again, washed in the blood of the Lamb, who are in America. We pray that the Lord may provide a way, and He will never fail to provide a way of escape for them. Wherever there is God's judgment coming, there will always be a caution. Even in Egypt, there was a caution. So that is why we are praying in Jesus' mighty name that Lord, even as you bring destruction upon this nation, as you bring your judgment upon this nation for all the pornography material that has come out of Hollywood, for all the filth that has come out of the American music industry, for all the abortions they've committed, for all the pain of function, experiments that have been conducted, experimenting on viruses and, and biological uh, weapons so that humanity was destroyed in the process of that. For all those sins, we say have mercy on believers. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. So, I want us to understand that we now stand like Abraham saying, Father, spare our brothers and sisters. Spare our brothers and sisters. And God will never fail. And that's why rapture is going to be a rescue plan. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And let me just talk about coming out before I, I go ahead of myself. Let me talk about coming out of Babylon. And again, the interesting thing about coming out of Babylon, it has three critical phases or three aspects to it. The, the process of coming out. Number one is holiness. Holiness. There is no use in coming out physically if you have not come out spiritually. Holiness is important. Holiness means to be separated unto God. You are not just separated physically from the system, but you are separated even spiritually. Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17. Therefore come out from them, be separate, says the Lord. It says, touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. This is in the New Testament. God is saying, touch no unclean thing. Says Amen. Amen. In the new covenant, God says, touch no unclean thing. So don't listen to a preacher that tells you that you can touch whatever you want to touch. You'll still be fine. Because it is God himself who says, touch no unclean thing. That is holiness. And then uh, if you move on to the second passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. It says, therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness. Out of reverence for God. Holiness can be perfected. And holiness is perfected through avoiding everything that contaminates body and spirit. You shun things that will contaminate your body. Things that will desecrate you spiritually and you know them. Hallelujah. So that is why when you have the spirit of the fear of the Lord in you. You don't go around asking, should I be doing this? Should I be doing that? Because the Spirit of the Lord within you will say, avoid that. It will contaminate you. Avoid this. It will defy you. So, you, 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 don't, you, you don't go around asking, should I be dating that guy? Yeah. You don't ask that. Yeah. Why? Because you have the Spirit of the Lord within you. You know what that guy is up to. You know his agenda. You don't need anyone to tell you that whether you should be smoking or not. Sure. You don't need somebody to tell you whether you should be doing rifa or not. You, 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 you can't be experimenting with insam. You know exactly whether you should be picking up that, 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 that glass of beer or not. You know, you know, you know the spirit of the Lord is within you. And the Spirit of the Lord is telling you, that's not for you. That's not for you. Hallelujah. Amen. 
You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You should not be doing that. You know that. Hallelujah. So now, that is why you can sell yourself short. When you go around asking, should I be drinking beer or not? What's wrong with smoking, smoking dacha? What's, what's, what's wrong? Just one sip of wine, recreationally? Huh? Just to pass times with my friends? When you're still, when you're still asking those questions, beloved, the chances are you're not listening to the Holy Spirit. Because He is the Spirit of the fear of the Lord. He is the Spirit of holiness. He is the spirit of righteousness. Hallelujah. Amen. So I want us to, 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 to begin to move in this, in, this, in this trajectory because we are coming out of Babylon and we are coming out in holiness. Amen. Praise the Lord. That is, that is why when Daniel understood that the 70 years of captivity was coming to an end, one of the things that he did was to repent. Repent. He allowed himself and the nation of Israel to go through cleansing because there is no effective coming out without repentance and without walking in holiness. <coughs> the second phase of coming out is economic freedom. Maybe Mom Pastor, if you can read Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Romans chapter 13, verse 8, economic freedom. This is very important. We don't want you to come out empty-handed. But as you come out, may you see the provision of the Lord. Hallelujah. As you are freeing yourself from a system that has been so oppressive over you, I pray that you may see the bounty, the abundance of God that you have never seen before. Amen. Romans chapter 13 verse 8. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Mm -hmm. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Mm -hmm. Now, may you be free from debt. Amen. Be free from debt. I, I pray in Jesus' name that those of us who are graduates, as you begin to work, May you change the way things have been done by the generation before you. Amen. The generation before you, our generation, when we graduated, one of the things that were high up on our list was expensive cars. Sure. We wanted to, to live an expensive lifestyle. Remember that we grew up in the township, some of us. Some of us come from villages where we were never exposed to good life, nice life. Yeah. And we told ourselves that the day I graduate, I will enjoy life. And we started a lifestyle of debt. A lifestyle of living on credit. We, 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 were, we were swapping credit cards left, right and center just to live a good life. And I pray in Jesus' name that you may change that as a younger generation. Praise the Lord. Don't repeat the mistakes that your parents made. Don't repeat the mistakes that your bigger brothers and sisters made. And that is why I'm so impressed when I see the, the, the younger guys, you know, Abo Pindo, Abo Pina, when I see them buy cars, yeah. the choices they make when they buy cars. Yeah. And I think this is good. This is good. This is good. Why? Why? Let me ask you something. If you're earning 30,000 grand, why should you buy a car that is taking half your salary? Why should you be doing that? In your first year of work, in your first year of work, 50% of your salary goes into your car installment. I mean, why should you be doing that? You see, let me say this, this message is practical. We will not come out of Babylon as long as we engage in financial commitments that are bigger than what we can afford. Yeah. Yeah. You will be trying to come out of Babylon, Babylon will be pulling you by a leech. You still owe me. You still owe me. So that is why I beseech you by the message of the Lord. The Bible says in Romans chapter 13 verse 8, let no debt remain outstanding. And here's the context. The context is, is actually in verse 11. The context in verse 11, it says, the hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber. Are you aware that part of waking up from our spiritual slumber means coming out of debt? Sure. 
And let me repeat that because you did not get it. Part of waking up from your spiritual slumber means you must be civil. You must be thinking carefully about how you use your money. Amen. Yes, Pastor Lord. Amen. Don't buy things you can't afford. Amen. Don't buy clothes you can't afford. Amen. Even if you can afford it, is it necessary? Amen. Because you see, when we migrate from Babylon to a place that God is calling us to go to, resources are needed so that we establish ourselves in the new place. Yes. Yes. I'm more impressed with the young graduate who says, I'm going to buy property yes. that is spend money Amen. on cars. I'm more, I'm, more, I'm, more impressed. I'm more impressed than somebody who says, no, I don't mind. I don't mind buying clothes from a very simple shop so that I can buy money. And so that I can buy property, so that I can buy something of value that I can use for the kingdom. Amen. Praise the Lord. Says I'm you. It's time for new thinking. It's time for new thinking. And don't worry about what people will say. I remember when I bought my first car as a doctor, it was an open astro. One of the challenges I faced was with my cousins. My cousins were the first one I, I, I remember showing up in my village. Driving an Opel Astra, you know, you think that people are going to say, hey, well done, guy, you know? <laughs> and then when I got to my village, I said, oh, no, 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 oh, 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 oh. this is not a doctor's car. <laughs> this is not a doctor's car. And many of us make decisions based on social pressure. You're even told, imagine, I'm sorry to say, some of these guys, you, you are being told by some of our cousins told you they do not even complete matric, but they have an opinion on what a doctor's car should look like. <laughs> Firing pressure by people that have not done even a quarter of what we've accomplished, but you succumb to that pressure. And that is why, again, and for no But in bag, and as long as I see better things to do, I will do better, better things than that. Praise the name of Jesus. So I want us to start thinking about those things, even even clothes for food, clothes. I'm sorry to say, sometimes you buy something that will cost you 15,000 rand, a piece of clothing that costs you 15,000 rand, and when you're wearing it, you can't even tell that it costs you so much. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to, 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 to tell you that, but, but here's the thing, it does not even show. <laughs> sometimes we even we even we even praise somebody who got something from pick and pay clothing. Someone ha has gotten something nice from pick and pay clothing, and we tell them you look so good. And they pretended that they they pretend like they got it from Foshini. You know, they, 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 they walked off. And, and, and here's the thing, it's a matter of perspective. It's a matter of perspective. Turn to 11 and say, think sober. About finances. Praise God. This, this is what it says. This is what it says. The rich, Proverbs 22 verse 7. The rich will rule over the poor. And the borrower will remain a slave to the lender. Here we are on the verge of leaving Babylon, but Babylon says you owe me. Yeah. You can't leave. You are not going anywhere because you owe me. That is why I want us to take it as part of our spiritual warfare to come against that in Jesus' name. Yeah. Come against it in the name of Jesus. Don't compete with your neighbors. It does not, even when it comes to schools, don't be under pressure to put your children in a private school. That's another pressure that, aff that affects parents. It's like, it's like you have not done enough for your children up until they're in a private school. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Yeah. Praise the name of Jesus. You need to wisen up. You cannot be playing to the gallery all the time. Who said that? Who said? Who said that you should have your, your children in an expensive school just to prove how much you love them? 
Correct that. Correct that. It's a lie. Hallelujah. And it's, it's also very interesting. When you get to varsity, because I, I went into a township school. When you get to varsity and you work hard at varsity, there is no label that says he went to a township school, he went to Michael House, he went to. No, 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 there is no label. Song is Shama assignment song. Song. It's a question of your perspective. So don't don't be pressured. You know? And some of these are, are you aware how expensive some of the schools are? Ninety thousand rand school fees. Ninety thousand rand damn school fees. Why is it not? Wake up. Wake up. And the end product, the end product of this uh, at metric, beloved. Tina Tina, let's see push on a master the eight, no push. I'm not. So I push up, so push up, you must study, and we're able to compete with kids from very expensive schools. It's a question of perspective. If you can put right values into your child, it doesn't matter even if they're going to a school in Chesterfield. Put the right mind in them. Teach them the, the right values. Help them with their homework. Encourage them to study. They will do well. Praise the name of Jesus. That half the graduates that are seated here did not go to expensive schools. Amen. I can guarantee you that. Says I'm attending. Yes, my foot. So I want to relieve. Of course, if you can afford it, it's okay. There's nothing wrong. If you can afford it, there's nothing wrong by all means. But if you know that you are complete competing with the Joneses, <laughs> if you are competing with the Joneses, please, please, that's a huge problem. And if you know you can't afford it, please don't do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Economic freedom is part.